I think everyone there is pretty good with this idea. So recapping really quickly, Carl is saying that superior people are people who can maximize their pleasures. Yeah, but then he says that brave soldiers are better than cowardly ones. Uh, but turns out that cowardly soldiers actually feel, if anything, a little bit more pleasure when the enemy runs away. So he's sort of, at the same time, saying that brave soldiers are better than cowardly ones, but also that cowardly soldiers are just as good, just as superior as brave soldiers because they can maximize their pleasure as well. Yeah. So we see how that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, what do we think Carlicles is going to say? Will he say, oh, Socrates, I never realized you were so wise. Please, take change your students. Yeah, he's just going to change change ideas, change teams, so he's going to change his theory around. Right? So let's go from section 6, this is, which is the very bottom of 91. Section 6. I'm only saying section 6 because in the textbook it's the 6th section that they have broken down. Um, but we're going by these italicized bits for sections. Yeah? Pretty much. Alright. Calibly shifts from commending mere quantity of pleasure to admitting that there are qualitative differences between pleasures. Quantity is the amount of, yeah? Quality is how good it is. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Do we want to write that down? Yes, yes. it's been quantitative and qualitative. I think we should write that down. Okay, let's write that down. So you can either do it in your book or just in the note and write that thing there. But you can feel stuff, and that the piece of stuff is If you're aware of come on, you can mentally feel it. Alright.
You get to understand the difference between these two words for uh, uni as well. They're really common words to discuss when we talk about research in any field, pretty much. So in research, a quantitative study is one that seeks to come up with some sort of results that can be expressed in number form. Yeah? How many cars go along police road during the day? Yeah? It would be a quantitative study. So we're getting like a solid number as the result. Yeah? But a qualitative study would seek to get some sort of a quality, uh, some sort of quality result at the end, some sort of quality um, assessment at the end. Yeah, so not just how many students learned how to add one plus one equals two to get uh, one plus one together, but how well did the students learn the concept of addition? Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. <coughs> So quantitative is, for the purpose of this reading, quantitative is just talking about how much of something we can get, and qualitative is what quality is it. Easy way to remember, quantitative would be like, how many diamonds can we find? And qualitative would be, how good are the diamonds? Yeah? So far, Carla, please, is just been saying you should get as many diamonds as possible. Yeah? Should it be the quality of the pleasure? Well, exactly, and that's what Socrates is leading Callicles by the nose towards, and that's exactly what Callicles is going to be switching his position to in a minute, pretending that he is saying this all along. Okay. Socrates says anything, Callicles changed to this. Alright, we ready to keep going? So shifting from admitting that there are qualitative differences between pleasures. Thinking to it, meaning to their qualitative. This allows Socrates to reintroduce the distinction between means and ends. What's a mean and an end? The means of getting to the end. The means of getting to the end. Good. The means are the, the method by which you do something. Yeah, they're like the tool or the action on the way to, and the end is the goal. Yeah, does that make sense to everyone? Cool. Um, We'll talk about that as we go. He argues that better pleasures are those whose longer term effects are good, which in turn confirms that pleasure is not the good, since the good is something that pleasure can aim for. Pleasure is a means to an end, something different, which is the concept of the good. Yeah? The good life then becomes a matter of foresight, not immediate feeling response, and therefore arguably requires expertise or wisdom. Socrates reminds Callicles of his earlier distinction between empirical knacks, whose goal is pleasure, and true branches of expertise, understanding, whose goal is the good. He counts rhetoric as a knack and criticizes all the great figures of Athenian history as mere flatterers of the populace, all the people, before sketching an outline of what true rhetoric would aim to do for its audience. In short, the expertise required to enable someone to live the good life is not the rhetoric that Gorgias practices and teaches. Remember, Gorgias and all of these people are like teachers, they're, they're sophists, they're mentors to people, and they travel around and it's their full-time job to teach people, they get paid to teach people how to do this. One of the main things that they teach people is how uh, to use rhetoric to convince their audiences of whatever they want, yeah? Or how to read their audiences to say what they think they'll like so they can get whatever they want, yeah? And Socrates is saying, you shouldn't be teaching your students how to just persuade based on whatever their audience thinks. You should be teaching your people to uh, speak the truth to the audience and hope that that leads you all to a better life. Okay? Would anyone like to be a, ca a character today? Jeremy. Abdul. Oh, for sure. Thanks for She's uh, uh, <laughs> um, Would you like to, can you be Carl, please, for me, Abdul? Yeah, Would anyone like to be Socrates? All right, Jeremy. 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 Surely it's Jeremy. <laughs> I'm happy to read, but if someone wants to read. I think Nick. Yes, it's retribution for being absent. Oh. I might just read because we have a fair bit to get through, and I'd love yeah. to get through it today. I don't know if we will get through all this today, but I'm happy. let's see how we go. So, Calabrese, you're up first. <laughs> I've been listening to you for quite a while now, Socrates. 
I've been saying yes on few, but what I've been thinking about is I wasn't the right to be taken season on any concession someone makes to you, even if he means it as a joke. Do you really think that I or anyone else would deny that there are better and worse pleasures? Mm. Oh no, you're behaving terribly, Carla, please. Well, first you claim that such and such is the case, and then that it isn't the case. This is the way you treat a child. It's so dishonest. I set out on this discussion in the belief that you are my friend, and so wouldn't deliberately deceive me. But as it turns out, I was wrong. Oof. And now I've got to make the best of my situation, as the old saying goes, and accept this offering of yours. It seems that what you're saying now is that there are better and worse pleasures. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> He's trying to do like, yeah, He's trying to be territorial. Um, let's it. just underline somewhere better and worse pleasures, because that'll remind you where this is in the reading. Well, beneficial pleasures are good, and harmful ones are bad, aren't they? Yes. Are they beneficial if they have a good effect, and harmful if they have a bad effect? Yes, I agree. Are you thinking, for example, of the physical pleasures of eating and drinking that we were talking about not long ago? Of how some of them make the body healthy or strong or good in some other way? Would you call these, the, would you call pleasures of this kind good and those which produce the opposite results bad? Yes, that's it. Doesn't, does the same go for unpleasant experiences? Are some good and some bad? Of course. Ah, isn't that an interesting flip from Calicles? So, let's go to the eating example first. What does that mean? Some eating pleasures are good and some are bad. Eating or something bad is bad. Like eating, some, like, like if you eat... Imagine having strawberry ice cream, that's pretty bad. Imagine what? if you eat... <laughs> Dude, you want to start this again, Abdul? <laughs> <laughs> no, idea. Home ground, this is <laughs> why I do ice cream. I'm saying it one more time. Let's imagine <laughs> that um, every single day, for every single meal, you eat chocolate. Just chocolate, that's all you eat, right? Oh, yeah. And chocolate is delicious. Let's just say that you're obsessed with chocolate, right? And it's a, it really makes you happy to eat it, yeah? What kind of pleasure would that be? Obviously bad, according to Socrates, and now according to Calicles, yeah? Because it has a bad effect in that you clog up your arteries and have a heart attack and you're done. Right? And that's not good. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's a good pleasure then from eating. Page speaks. <laughs> hate to break it to you guys, HSPs aren't that healthy. Okay. <laughs> HSPs are a heart attack in a box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, I heart attack in a box. Oh, really? yeah. So maybe eating like a balanced meal, yeah, is actually satisfying and it's good for you, so it has a good effect. So it's a pleasure that aims at the good. Does everyone see that? Okay, good. So, the same goes then for unpleasant experiences. Can anyone think of an unpleasant experience? that aims at the bad. Can anyone think of an unpleasant experience that makes your life worse? Torture. Torture, right? For no reason, it doesn't help you out, would be a good example of a bad experience, an unpleasant experience, that causes you distress and it doesn't aim at the good. Can anyone think of an unpleasant experience that does aim at the good, does make your life better, has a good effect. Homework, exactly. Homework is a good one, right? <laughs> Homework is an unpleasant experience. It causes distress, at least initially getting into it. Once you're in the zone, you're kind of okay. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but homework, right, is not a pleasant experience. You might think of something else like, um, like uh, exercising really hard, running a marathon or something, right? When you get to like the 18th kilometre, you're like, this is really hard, but it's aiming at living a healthy lifestyle, something like that, which is a good thing. Most people, well, some people say that's a good thing, right? Other people like, you know, think the word fun run is an oxymoron. Yeah. Alright, let's keep going. Who are we up to? Me or you? Good experiences? Are we up to that bit? Yeah. Uh, the ones we should be going for, shouldn't we? Whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. They're what we should be concerned with, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> Hadn't we better avoid bad ones? Obviously. Yeah, because Pallas, Polis and I decided, as you may remember, that the good in some form or other should be the reason for doing anything. Do you agree? Do you think, as Polis and I do, that all activity aims at the good and that the good should not be a means toward anything else? It should be the goal of every action. Are you going to support us and make it three? Yes. Cool, let's definitely write that out as a no. <laughs> Socrates argues that 
Every action opens it to your question. And almost over one bucket. Very good. And you're good. Is not <laughs> the means to any other end. <laughs> two one. What's two one? What's two one? Top of the school, I'm sorry. Ah. <laughs> so he's talking about preseason. It doesn't matter. <laughs> a win is a win. <laughs> the <laughs> Alright, so Socrates has this idea that every human action is aimed at the good, or should be aimed at the good. Does this make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think all of your actions are aimed at what you think of as the good life? Most of the time, yes. Um, has anyone ever uh, done, some, done something that they know they really shouldn't have? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and do you think that that action aimed at the good? Yeah, yeah. 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 to find good. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we've all, we've all probably done things that we think didn't really aim at the good life for us, or at least maybe they aimed at a lesser, a less good life than we could have aimed at, right? Yes. But Socrates is arguing that all things being perfect, and if we're being perfectly rational and we're being reasonable people. We should have all our actions aimed towards the good. Yeah? So what the good is then becomes a really big topic of debate. And that's what we're arguing about here. Callicles says the good is just pleasure. Yeah? The Socrates is going to say no. Actually, pleasure is just a means to the end. Yeah? Uh, where are we? All right, it follows that the good in some form should be the goal of pleasant activities as much as of any other kind of activity rather than pleasure being the goal of good activities. That's right. Now, is just anyone competent to separate good pleasures from bad ones or does it always take an expert? It takes an expert. I think we better remind ourselves of another view I happen to express while talking to Polis and Gorgi. As you may remember, I held that there are some procedures which are restricted to pleasure, that's all they have to offer, and to fail to distinguish between, and which fail to distinguish between better and worse. But I also held that there are other procedures, procedures being human activities, which do know what's good and what's bad. I proposed cookery of a typical example of a procedure which is concerned with pleasure and I called it a knack rather than an area of expertise. And medicine is a typical example of an area of expertise which is concerned with what's good. Now, for God's sake, Carlos, and for the sake of our friendship, please don't think it's all right for you to play games with me and answer my questions any old how, without caring whether you contradict what you really think. And at the same time, please don't treat what you hear from me as if I was playing games with you. Are you somehow unaware that there's nothing which even a relatively unintelligent person would take more seriously than the issue that we're discussing? The issue of how to live one's life. The life you're recommending to me involves the manly activities of addressing the assembled people, rhetorical training, and the kind of political involvement you and your sort are engaged in. But is that the right way to live? Or is this philosophical life of mine better? And if so, what makes it better? So perhaps it would be best for us to distinguish these two ways of life <coughs> along the lines I tried out just now. And then, once we've agreed that they're different, we should try, if there really are two ways of life, to see how they differ and which of them is the one we follow. Anyway, you may not have yet understood my point. No, I haven't. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's talk about these two things. We have, on the one hand, expertise. What is expertise? Being an expert at something. Yeah, someone who's an expert. Like, what is an expertise? Like, the expert in a specific field. It's any activity which. Yeah. Oh, I is an expert. No. Well, yes, but. 
He differentiates this from Nats. Expertise and Nats. About four years ago, this was a question on the exam. So, it's good to know about yourself. What is a nap? It's any activity which aims at pleasure. Good. So, a nap is any activity which aims at pleasure. What's the example in the reading? Cooking. Oh, Cooking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Any activity which aims at expertise aims at good luck. Yeah, the good. The example is sorry. It's to do with healthy eating. Good medicine. So, it's worth pointing out that when Socrates talks about doctors, he's talking really about them in the sense of them being dietitians. And when he talks about cooks, he's talking about them in the sense of them being like makers of delicious things, like cakes or sweets, that kind of stuff. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. So, for Socrates then, an expertise is something that aims at the good, regardless of pleasure, whereas naps are activities that just aim at pleasure. Yeah? Expertise... Gives us... The ability to distinguish between good and bad.
correct? So, no, I haven't. Oh, wow. That's fine. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. All right, ready to go? Excellent. So, all right. I'll try to explain myself better. You and I have already agreed that there's good and there's pleasure, and that the good and the pleasant are not identical. We've also agreed that there are certain processes and procedures for obtaining each of these two. Ways of pursuing, respectively, pleasure and uh, the good. But before I go any further, I'd better find out whether or not you accept even this. Do you? Yes, I do. Alright then. I wonder whether you'll also go along with the idea I suggested to our friends here. That is, I wonder if you thought at the time that I was right. I told them that to my mind, cookery was a knack rather than a branch of expertise as medicine is. And I went on to say that one of these processes, medicine in fact, has had considered both the nature of the object it looked after and the reason for its actions, and could therefore explain its results. Pleasure, however, is the sole point of the other one's attendant. There is absolutely no expertise involved in the way it pursues pleasure. It hasn't considered either the nature of pleasure or the reason why it occurs. It's, comple it's a completely irrational process. It hasn't itemised things at all, so to speak. All it can do is remember a routine which has become ingrained by habituation and past experience, and that's also what it relies on to provide us with pleasant experiences. Do you think this is a satisfactory account? That's the main question. But then I also want to ask whether you think there are practices whose province is the mind rather than the body. And which are analogous in the sense that while some of them involve expertise and work out in advance what will be best for the mind, others don't care about that. And, as was the case with cookery, have restricted their thinking to how the mind gets a pleasure. Not only have they not given any consideration to whether there might be qualitative differences between pleasures, they're simply not interested in anything except gratifying the mind, whether that is to its advantage or disadvantage. The point is, Caleb, is I do think these practices exist, and I maintain that pandering like this to the pleasures of the body or the mind or whatever, without taking into consideration the question of better or worse, it's flattery. What about you? Do you endorse this view of mine, or disagree? Oh, I agree. As a favour to Corvius, and so that the discussion is about to be complete. What do you think Socrates thinks of that answer? He's like, well, you're not really coming along for the ride anymore, are you, Calipis? Yeah. But he's going to continue it anyway. Why? Because he loves talking about what he thinks to Socrates. <laughs> yeah. Now, can this only happen to one mind at a time, rather than to two or more? No, it can happen to two or more. So if there's a whole crowd of people, it's possible to gratify all their minds at once without considering what's best for them. Is that right? I'd say so. Can you tell me which activities have this effect? Perhaps it would be better for me to ask you specific questions and for you to tell me whether or not you think the activity I've mentioned does have this effect. Is that alright with you? Let's start with playing the reed pipe. Do you think it belongs to this category of calipers? Is its sole purpose to give us pleasure without worrying about anything else? I think so. And so on for all related activities, like playing the guitar in competitions? Yes. And what about training choirs to sing? Dithyrambic poetry you've composed. Don't you think it belongs here? I mean, do you think that guy, the son of Milas, is the slightest bit interested in having his words improve his audience? Synesius, is it? Synesius? Cool. Uh, to his words improve his audience rather than in finding a way to gratify a packed theatre? Well, it's clear, at least in the case of Synesius, that He's only interested in giving pleasure, Socrates. What about his father, Mila? Mil Milas? Anyone know? Uh, Mel oh, what the All right. Should we keep going? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where are we? Come on, what was it? Andy, where are we again? That's all I need. That's all I need. Yeah. 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 That's all I need. That's all I need. Yeah. That's all I need. Are we all there? <coughs> That's all I need. There are two different speakers, kind of speakers, right? If the activity is twofold like that, then one of its two aspects is presumably flattery and popular oratory of the contemptible sort, the disgusting, the not worthy sort. 
while the other is the admirable procedure of trying to perfect the minds of one fellow, one's fellow citizens, and of struggling to ensure that the speeches one delivers have the highest moral content, whether or not it makes people enjoy listening to them. For Socrates, a moral life is a good life. But you've never come across this latter kind of rhetoric. If you can think of any rhetorician who fits this description, why don't you tell me his name? He's saying that none of the speakers who teach rhetoric, none of the politicians that he's ever come across, are interested in helping their fellow citizens live more moral lives. Instead, they only ever say what's popular, what will get them votes and money and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense to everyone? Can you tell me his name? I certainly can't think of any contemporary rhetoricians anyway. Well, can you think of, can you name a single rhetorician from the past who's supposed to have been instrumental from his first public speech onwards in changing the Athenian people from the terrible state they'd been in before to a better one? If you can, please do so, because I don't know who it is. But what about Thanos? Blah, blah, blah. People say he was a good man, don't they? And then there are Simon and Miltiads and Heracles who's only recently died, and you actually heard him speak. Yes, Calibles, they were good men all right. That is, if your earlier description of goodness was true, and it consists in satisfying your own and others' desires. But if that's not the case, if there's some truth in the conclusions the subsequent discussion led us inexorably towards, and we should satisfy only those desires whose fulfilment makes us better people, not those whose fulfilment makes us worse, and, when, and we decided that this whole area was a matter of expertise. Well, can you say that any of the men you mentioned were good in that sense? I don't know what to say. You'll come up with something if you search in the right way. Let's take an unhurried look then and see whether any of them were good in that sense. Now, speeches delivered by a good man, someone who wants what's best for his audience, aren't aimless but have a purpose, don't they? Might be worth just highlighting that bit, a good man. It's a good little summary line. Speeches delivered by a good man, someone who wants the best for his audience. That's what a good man is. There's a question on the set, what's a good man? <laughs> Surely it's a good man. Aren't aimless but have a purpose, don't they? It's the same with all other craftsmen too. Each of them bears in mind his particular task and so doesn't select and apply his materials aimlessly, but with the purpose of getting the object he's making to acquire a certain form. If you need examples, look at painters, builders, shipwrights, any craftsman you like, in fact. Each of them organises the various components he works with into a particular structure and makes them accommodate and fit one another until he's formed the whole into an organised and ordered object. That's what all craftsmen do, including the ones we were talking about not long ago. To deal with the human body, trainers and doctors, I mean. They order and organise the body in a way. Are we in agreement on this or not? I dare say you're right. Right. Underline or highlight organize and order and organize. This idea of things being ordered and organized as being better is pretty central for Socrates. So it takes organization and order to make a house good, doesn't it? And without these qualities, any house is worthless. Yes. And the same goes for ships. Yeah. And for our bodies too, we're saying. Yeah. Oh, bro. You gotta chill out with that. Don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do it like me. What are you doing it? You take part of Yes. You wanna be calibrated for a while? No, 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 no. I'll be, no. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Congratulations. What about the mind? <laughs> Can a disorganized mind be a good mind? Or does it take organization and order to make a mind good as well? We have to think so. The preceding argument leaves us no choice. Can you talk to the person next to you about that? Uh, is a good mind an organised one? Can you have a disorganised mind that's a good one? Or is an organised one always better? Talk to the person what do you mean by good person? Mm -hmm. Well, that's always the question, isn't it? But yeah, you tell me. You can't find it. Yeah. I know. I know it's not okay. Have a look. If you can't find it, come and see me, and I'll give you that. I don't want to waste people. Well, I've already got two. Okay. Very hard. I'm pretty sure we've been killed. I just put it up online. Oh, 
Somehow is sometimes good, or is an organized mind always better? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Damon, what do you think? <laughs> always better? Yeah, because like a disorganized mind, what does that mean? You mean like, you, you, you could have like schizophrenia or something. Yeah, a, a serious mental illness would be a disorganized oh, mind. Yeah, for sure. Or maybe on a less uh, big scale, it might just be being like quite forgetful. Yeah, that might be a disorganized mind. What else could a disorganized mind be? Your thoughts are like random as. Like thoughts are random as? Just yeah. always all over the place. Always all over You're the place. Focusing on like a million different things at once. So Good. Maybe though, as well, you have a bunch of beliefs in your mind that don't line up with each other. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you think, um, oh, the best, I, what I really want in the future is to, have, to be really healthy. When I'm old, I want to be one of those old people that's really healthy and goes on walks every day. And then you think, what I love eating every day is HSPs and chocolate, <laughs> right? And Socrates would say that that's a disorganized mind, right? Because those two beliefs don't don't fit together. Does everyone see that? Yeah. Would you describe Genghis Khan as organized and strategic? Organized and strategic. Is was Genghis Khan an organized mind? Yes. He was organized. I mean, he was certainly effective, wasn't he? Yeah. We don't really know what the state of his mind was like necessarily. Um, we could say there's and there's some Babylonian empires as well that were quite quite large, right? And they invaded and they murdered heaps of people, millions millions of people, perhaps, right? But then they made all these laws that were actually quite uh, just, like you can't murder people in our town, right? That's a pretty good law to have, right? But the only reason he got there and made that law was because he already invaded and murdered a whole bunch of people to do it in the first place, right? So maybe we'd say that was disorganized, but on the other hand. Maybe he was coherent with himself, I don't know. Yeah. So, quick question. Have you had um, the new hot rod yet? Can I say? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. The Cheetos. The Cheetos move on. Sorry? The Cheetos. What? Cheetos. Alright. Cheetos move on. Let's get going. That was a me. That was a me. Let's get going. What about mind? Would a disorganized mind be a good mind? Or does it take an organization and order to make the mind good as well? We have to think so the preceding argument leaves us no choice. Now, what do we call the effect of organization and order on the body, Jeremy? I suppose you mean health and fitness. Yeah. Next then, what do we call the effect of organization and order on the mind? What's the equivalent term to health in this case? Can you come up with one? Why don't you tell us yourself, Socrates? All right, I will, if that's what you prefer. <laughs> if you think I'm right, please tell me. But if you think I'm wrong, then let me get away with it. Show me why I'm wrong. In my opinion, we describe processes which organize the body as healthy because they cause health and wealth. Whatever else constitutes a good physical state. Is that right or not? It is. And we describe the processes which organize and order the mind as law or convention because they make the mind law abiding and orderly, which is to say they imbue the mind with justice and self control. Agreed? I dare say you're right. Probably shouldn't have agreed to that, should he? Yeah? Because he's saying that an ordered mind is better, closer to the good, than a disorganized mind. And he's now saying that an organized mind is one which follows law or convention to achieve justice and self-control. Yeah, let's write that down for Socrates. An organized mind. Is one that which yeah. 
that's the question. I don't think it's going to be on the exam, so I might not include it. Uh, How's potato? That's a vegetable. So, you've got the, an organized mind, follows law, and self control. Uh, let's do this. Um, Socrates. Analogy.
Ale to je stejný typ, který je jiný typ, který je stejný typ, který je jiný typ. A ještě to malý typ. We're almost at the last bit of this discussion, and this is the bit where it gets uh, really bad for calculus. Because Socrates is arguing that when you try and teach people, you should teach them about truth and justice and help lead their minds towards being in that state, even if they disagree with you and even if it's unpleasant for them to hear. Yeah, and you should do it in a way that convinces them to live a good life, even if it's less pleasant. Yeah, whereas he thinks that the rhetorician will just tell people what they want to hear to maximize their own pleasure and the pleasure in their fellow citizens. They're trying to just make their lives happy and nice. Yeah, do you think Calipers is enjoying what Socrates is saying? No, not at all, right? But Socrates doesn't care because Socrates is this person that's trying to lead Callicles' mind towards a disciplined, more ordered life so that Callicles can get closer to living the good life. Is Callicles a good student? No, not in this, right? He's not a very good student, but he's sort of at least admitting where he uh, is wrong, but he's not liking it, is he? He's finding it really unpleasant. But Socrates is happy to have this conversation with him, even if he finds it unpleasant, because he thinks he's leading him towards a more ordered, a, a better life. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. And nevertheless, Socrates is going to get put to death, executed, for being so annoying to all his fellow Athenians. Yeah? He's going to be, he's causing so much displeasure that they're going to execute him. That's a lot of displeasure, right? But he's doing it anyway, because he thinks that aiming at the good is the moral imperative. You have to do that to help everyone live a good life, including yourself. And if you compromise and just say things that people want to hear, then you're living the bad life. Does that make sense to everyone? So this is the bit where it gets really bad for Callicles, because it's the bit where he's lost the argument, but like on multiple levels. Because Callicles, Socrates is saying that we should be the kind of person that I am in this discussion. And we shouldn't be the kind of person that you are in this discussion. And Callicles is being forced to agree. Yeah? So let's have a read of this, this Italus essay. Faced with defeat, Callicles resorts once more to sullen abuse. Socrates continues the argument alone. The good life and human happiness depend crucially, he argues, on self-discipline. In fact, the whole universe can only function well as an orderly whole. The arguments he has been putting forward and this cosmic perspective provoke the justification for the revolutionary view which provoked Calicles' entry into the discussion. That doing wrong is worse than suffering it. Yeah? This is what we're coming back to. The idea that it's better to suffer wrong, it's better to suffer for doing the right thing, trying to be a good person, rather than doing the wrong thing to live a pleasant life, maybe. All right. Are you excited to be in car, please, Jerry, or do you want to? Oh, I can do it if you like to. Excellent, thanks. Um, I'm going to be Socrates and I'll be car, please, for a bit. Okay. Sweet. Yes. I don't know what you're going on about, Socrates. You better find someone else to answer your questions. My friend here comes down, people will do anything good. In fact, he comes down what we're talking about, being disciplined. Oh, actually, your, these arguments of yours don't interest me in the slightest. I've only been answering your questions for Gorgias' sake. Well, what shall we do then? Are we going to break it off in the discussion? No, it's up to you. People say it's wrong to leave even stories unfinished. A story needs a head on it, they say. Otherwise it goes around the fence. So please help our discussion get ahead by answering the rest of my questions. You're a bully, Socrates. <laughs> my advice to you would be to forget about the discussion. Or at least find someone else to talk to. Any volunteers? No? 
Let's not leave the argument unfinished. Couldn't you complain to yourself? Couldn't you just talk to yourself and answer your own questions? Then I'd really have to be, as every drama, every drama puts it, capable of saying all alone what it took two men to say before. By the looks of it, though, I don't have any choice in the matter. All right, let's do it that way. Once knowledge of what it is and isn't true in these matters is out in, in the open, we all benefit equally. So I think we should all try to be the first to get there. I'll tell you how I think the argument goes on. Then. But it's up to you to challenge me and show me where I'm going wrong. If any, if any of you get the impression that I'm failing to recognize the space of my own thinking. The point is, you see, that I certainly don't speak as an expert with knowledge. I look into things with your help. And this means that if someone disputes something I've been saying and seems to me to be making a good point, I'm the first to admit it. But there's no point in me saying all this unless you think we've already finished the argument. If you don't want to carry on, let's leave it there and go home. Nah, so this is because of Plato in large part, this is like a fundamental position of philosophy. It's like starting from ignorance and then trying to work towards some truth, but in Plato's sense, that really means in discussion with other people. He thought that's the only way you made progress in terms of figuring out concepts. How to live a good life, for example. Does that make sense? It's hard to do alone, Plato thought. That's why he has that whole speech. But then Gorgia said, well, I at any rate don't think we ought to go home yet, Socrates. I'd like you to complete the argument. And I get the impression everyone else wants you to as well. In fact, for my part, I'd like to hear you round the argument off by yourself. My own personal preference, though, Gorgias, would have been for our friend Callicles to have gone on talking to me until I have repaid and received the speech without him. Anyway, even if you're not prepared to finish our discussion, Callicles, you must at least take me up on anything you hear from me which strikes you as incorrect. And if you do prove me wrong, I won't get cross with you as you did with me. No, I'll make sure the public register this to you as my greatest benefactor. Just get it over with, Socrates. Here, here goes then. I'll review the whole argument so far. Is the pleasant the same as the good? No, they're different. Calipers and I agreed on that. Should the good be the reason we do pleasant things, or the pleasant be the reason we do good things? The good should be the reason we do pleasant things. Let's highlight some of these things as we go, because they're a really nice, really nice summary of the argument. So the top bit, is the pleasant the same as the good? No, they're different. And then under that, the good should be the reason we do pleasant things, not the other way around. And then the next bit as well, let's highlight as uh, Jeremy reads for us. Is, isn't it the quality of being pleasant which makes us enjoy things, and the quality of being good which makes us good? Yes. Now, what does it take to be a good human being? What does it take to be a good anything, in fact? It always takes a specific state of goodness, doesn't it? I don't see how we can deny that, Calipers. And whether we're talking about a good artifact, a good body, a good mind, for that matter, or a good creature, what it takes for states of goodness to occur in an ideal form is not chaos, but organization and perfection, and a particular amount of expertise which forms the object in question is. Right, I agree. Uh, next bit. In every case, then, a good state is an organized and orderly state, isn't it? I'll say so. So a thing has to be informed by a particular order or the structure. The structure appropriate for it to be good, doesn't it? I think so. Doesn't it follow that a mind possessed of a proper, proper structure is better than a disordered mind? It's bound to be. But a mind possessed of orderly structure is an orderly mind, isn't it? Naturally. And an order, orderly mind is, is a self-disciplined mind. Absolutely. For which it follows that self-disciplined mind is a good mind. Now, I can't say anything else with the argument. Tell it please, but if you can, please tell me what it is. Cool, highlight a couple more bits in that at the end there that you think are relevant. <coughs> and the conclusion that we get to a self-disciplined mind is a good mind. Just get on with it, Socrates. All right. If a self-disciplined mind is good, then a mind in the opposite state is bad. In other words, an undisciplined and self-indulgent mind is bad, yes. Now, a disciplined person must act in an appropriate manner towards both God and his fellow human beings, because inappropriate behavior 
think it indicates lack of self-discipline. Yes, that's a, that's a bad thing to say. Well, when appropriate is used of the way we relate to our fellow human beings, it means just. And then it's applied to the way we relate to the God, it means religious. And of course, anyone who acts justly and religious is a just and religious person. True? We also, we also bounce out of code. Because disciplining the person doesn't choose inappropriate objects to seek out or avoid. No, he turns it, he turns it. He, t- he turns towards or away from events, people, places, and irritations as and when he should, and steadily endures what he should endure. It follows, calculates, that because a self-disciplined person is just declared in religion, as we've explained, through the paradigm of goodness, now a good person is going to do whatever he does well and successfully, and success brings fulfillment and happiness, whereas a bad man does badly and is therefore unhappy. Unhappiness, then, is the lot of someone who is like a self discippointed in other words, in other words, the kind of self indulgent person you were championing. That's my position, and I believe it to be true. It really, it, it really is true, and it looks as though anyone who wants to be happy must seek out practice and practice self discipline and be as hasty a retreat as possible away from self indulgence. The best course would be will be for him to see it that he never has to do it again. But if or anyone close to him, whether that's an individual person or a human being, he does ever need it, then he must let justice and straight be in place. The last thought that has to be in there. That's true. Maybe. Alright. Do you have a good attempt? Do you have a good attempt? I tell you what. Do you have a good attempt? She put answers on it. On Facebook, like, I don't think we're going to get a catch-up. We're going to get a catch-up today as well. Well, they're already on campus, we're just getting a catch-up. That's what she said, the scores are passed on the... Have you checked the score? Yeah. I don't know what we're talking about. I just did it. I don't know how to ask it. That's it. Yeah, 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 that's it. All right, how much is it? I don't know. Is it cheaper? Follow me. We just got the local. Is it cheaper? Who? Yeah, don't have a door price. Me. How much for the new All right, let's finish up the segment, please. Work with the people next to you from A to Seven. First one A good person does things well and is what? And that thing brings fulfillment and something. So a good person is what? Mister, I think you left blank, sir. I think I did too. <laughs> Fifteen minutes left in the class, guys. Yeah, well, Friday. We can just fire away. This close. Do you think it's going to extend the weekends and have like some spiders or Do you need me to play some music for you? Jeremy, you know he's still at the school, right? So, finish that break, so like... Oh, yeah, I saw him the other day and I was like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday... Would you like me to play some yoga music for you, kids? And it's like... Let's say it's nine to five. I'm sorry, I think it's called... I do it, but I prefer one of the midday or weekdays. Why did it Thursday night was really good? I prefer like a Wednesday off. It's so frustrating when you think it's uh, when it's Thursday and you think it's Friday. Uh, <coughs> it's annoying. Anyone doing physics period six today? Yeah. yeah. Wait, we got an extra. I'm covering, I'm covering up physics class. Oh, it's yes. Uh, I'll see you in physics, sir. I'm going to talk about the boss. Sure. <laughs> Can anyone help me out then? So, premise one is a good person does things well, things well, and is. Discipline. What have we got here? Discipline. Discipline? Yes. Good person does things well, uh, awesome. Which fire might be here? Awesome. 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 Is that what it is? Oh, right. okay. Totally rad. And is, a, and is a legend. A good person does things well, and is disciplined. Legendary. Yeah, well. Or would you say so? Successful is what I'm looking for. A good person does things well. 
because a good person is disciplined, right? And because you do things well, you are successful. So I'm going to use You're successful is the word. Is this right? Is a disciplined person successful? Yes. Yeah. More often than not? Yeah. Always? Not always. No. We might have a problem with this premise. A disciplined person isn't always successful. Yeah. yeah? Like a disciplined driver doesn't always avoid a car accident, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Socrates is arguing it like it's a universal truth. Regardless, let's just take it for now. A good, per a good person, by which you mean self-disciplined, does things well and is successful. And success brings fulfillment and happiness. Happiness. So a good person is oh my God. happy. live by in my opinion. This is the end of the reading guys, this page, so I really want to get through the next 10 minutes if we can. Hyperdrive. So Ourselves to live by in my opinion. We should devote all our own and our community's energies towards ensuring the presence of justice and self-discipline and so guaranteeing happiness. What's the end of a good life? What's a good life then? It's a happy life for Socrates, right? So let's distinguish really clearly for Socrates between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is not the same thing as happiness for Socrates. When he says happiness, remember he means this thing. Let's write this word instead. Um, eudaimonia. Can we write this down? Whoa, okay. So when Socrates is saying happiness, I want you to read eudaimonia, and it's closer to a deep sense of satisfaction than it is to a moment-to-moment -moment feeling of joy or pleasure. Yeah, everyone get that? All right. We should devote all our own and our community's energies towards ensuring the presence of justice and self-discipline and so guaranteeing eudaimonia. That's what should guide our actions. We shouldn't refuse to restrain our desires because that condemns us to a life of endlessly trying to satisfy them. Yeah, we shouldn't refuse to restrain our desires because that condemns us to a life, a life of endlessly trying to satisfy them. Some philosopher said something like, or some US president or someone, he said something like, so, um, rather than trying to achieve all the things that would make me happy, I've learned to limit my desires to be more satisfied. This is kind of the same argument, yeah? So you learn not to try and get everything you want, but to limit what you want, so you can be satisfied with what you have. Everyone good with that so far? Uh, and this is the life of a predatory outlaw, in the sense that anyone who lives like that will never be on good terms with anyone else, any other human beings, let alone a god, since he's incapable of cooperation, and cooperation is a prerequisite for friendship. In fact, Calibri, the expert's opinions is that cooperation, love, order, discipline, and justice bind heaven and earth, gods and men. That's why they call it the uni that's why they call the universe an ordered whole, my friend rather than a disorderly mess or an unruly shambles. 
It seems to me that for all your expertise in the field, you're overlooking this point. You fail to notice how much power geometrical equality has among gods and men, and this neglect of geometry has led you to believe that one should try to gain a disproportionate share of things. Socrates thinks that everything in the heavens and the earth has its proper place in a well-ordered system, and a well-ordered system leads towards the good. Yeah? This is a broader point. This isn't particularly relevant for our study of the good life, at least in terms of contemporary discussion, I guess. Although you might want to argue that finding your place is important. Yeah? Let's keep going. There you are, then. Now, either we have to prove this argument wrong by showing that happiness does not depend on a person having the attributes of justice and self-discipline, and unhappiness on immorality, or we have to accept that it's true and try and see what follows from it. All those earlier conclusions follow Calicles, the ones you asked me if I was serious about, when I claimed that we should denounce any wrongs committed not only by ourselves, but even by our family and friends, and that this is what rhetoric should be used for. Moreover, the point Paul is conceded out of embarrassment, according to you, has turned out to be true, that doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong, precisely <coughs> because it's worse than suffering wrong. Does everyone see how this follows? Do you want to write out a note for that? Yeah. All right. So, if we accept, that true happiness is achieved. Only by Socrates isn't saying you should just be a good person, even if it makes you unhappy. He's saying that being a good person will make you happy, and that if you are a bad person, you will be unhappy. Make sense? Can anyone think of a counterexample? Genghis Khan? Good counterexample, maybe. If you think that Genghis Khan really was happy, then he's a good counterexample if you say that he also had, like, an unorganized mind, one that didn't aim at justice and the good. Yeah? But Socrates is arguing that you can only really be happy if your mind and yourself aims at justice and truth and goodness and all that kind of stuff. Yeah? That's how you'll find, remember, maybe not pleasure, but satisfaction, eudaimonia, a deep well being. All right, I'm going to keep going while we write those things down because I want to, we'll see how we go. Uh, and it's also true that for someone to be a genuine rhetorician, he does in fact have to be a moral person and to understand morality. 
and this in its turn was the point to follow Seth Gorgias conceded out of embarrassment. Against this background, let's consider whether or not you are right to fault me for my inability to defend myself or any of my family and friends or rescue them from terrible danger. You say that I'm as vulnerable as a person with no status at all to anyone's passing inclination to smash me in the face, to use your forceful expression. Confiscate my property, send me into exile, or even, if worse comes to worse, to kill me. And according to you, there is nothing more contemptible than being at the mercy of people like this. Well, I've already stated my view more than once, but there's no harm in repeating it. I deny that being wrongly smashed in the face, or stabbed, or robbed by a cup curse, is, a more, is a, the most contemptible thing that can happen to a person. Calicles, I claim that it's more contemptible, and worse as well, to hit and cut me and my property without just cause. And I also claim that to steal, enslave, burgle, and in short to do any kind of wrong against me and my property is not only worse for the wrongdoer than it is for me, the target of his wrongdoing, but it's also more contemptible. Why is it bad for someone to punch someone else in the face for no reason, according to Socrates? Because he's doing the wrong thing. And doing the wrong thing is worse for him because it reveals that he has 